Hi, everybody. Welcome to Meet the Mentor with Chantal Barber. I'm Anna Zanella. I'm one of Chantal's navigators. Um, the other navigator that Chantal has is Lynn, who's also here on the call. And uh, there is also Brenda. Brenda, uh huh. She might be popping in as well. So we'll see. Um, but that means that we uh, help. Chantal facil facilitating some of the mentorship groups that she runs uh, and also courses um, that there are coming up in October, November. Um, I will quickly introduce Chantel. Um, Chantel Barber yearns to promote the human spirit in her work. She believes that when it comes to the human race, there is more that unites than divides. There's beauty in everyone, regardless of whether they measure up to society's definitions of beauty. Not only their joys, but their sorrows. She wants to show the beauty in the human condition. Chantel is on a journey to capture the vision in her mind's eyes, the blood that we as humans share. And she does it all in acrylic with strong color, energetic brushstroke, light, and story. Her loose style draws the viewer's attention, visually becoming them to wonder at the essence of life. So um, how about I, I will pass it on to you, Chantel. Um, and if it, there's... Other things you want to talk to us about, uh, we briefly talked about, you know, talking about your inspiration and mm -hmm. how you became an artist um, and uh, your switch from being an oil painter to an acrylic painter, which shows a lot, I think still shows a lot in your, in your style, right? Yes, it does. It does. Uh well, I guess then I'm I'm on. I will will start. Um, I'm very excited about what I do. I'm excited about not only using the acrylic medium, but painting people have that's my passion. Figures, people. I have drawings that I did when I was like three years old, and they were always people. Uh, so it's a privilege to be able to continue to do this and to share it with everyone. Uh, I did start off with oil paints. I learned to paint in oil probably when I was, I think I was 10 or 11 years old. And it was a woman across the street from our house who would have me over once a week. And she gave me lessons. And she also gave me uh, cinnamon rolls, which made me want to come back for those lessons. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really good. And uh, I stuck with oil till I was probably, I don't know, I think I was about 20 when I made the switch and the oil was okay. It, it really, I didn't know that there were any other options. And we did a move across country and uh, the movers said, oh, we can't pack your oil paints. They're flammable and you can't do that. And so we put them in our car and we drove across country and uh, got to a, a motel and very foolishly left everything in the car and someone broke in and stole it all. <laughs> And so oh. I thought, you know, I was looking, my husband had just gone into the military. We had like 20 years ahead of us. And it was like, I can't be doing this every time we get transferred. So somebody said to me, have you ever tried acrylic? And that was the very first time I was introduced to acrylic and I loved it. However, uh, the college I was attending at the time, it was all acrylic was meant for abstract painting, very, um, flat, almost a, um, just a very different look than what I wanted to do. And uh, the people around me said, oh, you can't do what you want with the acrylic. You know, this is what we do with the acrylic. And I kept thinking that um, I knew what I wanted to do with the medium, but I couldn't find anyone to show me how to work it to capture the idea I had of, of what I felt like this could do. And so what I ended up doing was taking workshops from um, oil painters when I could or watching, you know, videos, being influenced by them. And then I would always figure out how to do the same thing they were doing with the acrylics. 
And it's funny because every time I would go to a workshop, people come over and they'd look at me almost like I'm an alien from outer space and, oh, you're working in acrylic. Mm, you know, and I, I thought, okay, yes, I am working in acrylic. I feel kind of like I'm standing out here, but it was a great experience because after uh, a lot of experimentation at my own easel, I came to a place where I approach acrylic differently than most acrylic artists do. I was not taught by an acrylic artist per se, because at the time I couldn't find any who want, were teaching what I wanted to learn. And before I knew it, um, I was the one teaching it and I still can't quite figure out how that happened, but that's good. <laughs> it's all been good. Uh, so it's, it's been a great journey and I continue even all these years later, uh, I think my bio says like 25 years plus experience. Well, it's actually over 30 now. I just forget, you know, time keeps moving. But all these years later, I'm still discovering things that you can do with acrylic and, and wonderful mark making tools. And it's just so great because I'm not having to wait for things to dry. I'm using that to my advantage, but yet you can still be on par with the level of a, uh, so I happen to be a member of the Portrait Society of America, and I can still be on par with those artists who are working in oil and doing portrait commissions and doing, you know, demos and things. And I do not feel that the acrylic medium has ever held me back in what I've wanted to do with it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that's awesome. Like, um, so feel free to ask questions, anyone, um, if you have questions for Chantel. Uh, um, yeah, so like, I, I guess, well, my group has been with Chantel for about three months. And, and mm -hmm. that's, we have been attracted to, of course, the beautiful work that Chantel does and the mark making. And uh, so when we were planning to do a Meet the Mentor, that's what we were discussing, right, Chantel, that we wanted yes. to do how you do it differently and uh, unexpected um, supplies and, and materials and that kind of stuff to create the beautiful work that you do. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody have questions, comments, anything? You feel free to interrupt or put the questions in the chat if you have questions. Um, do you want to tell like I can um, show your your painting bigger? Yes. And we'll jump into your demo, and then mm -hmm. I mean we we'll talk about it as you as you go. Right? Uh, we can talk yes. about. It. Here we can talk about yes that. definitely uh there the wonderful thing about um and are you gonna highlight the easel i can't tell from my screen oh, yes there we go spotlighted for everyone to see wonderful well the light looks really good on it i was working on that this afternoon this is one i just recently started um and it is going to be quite a challenge. I always wonder why I do that to myself. I've given myself these challenges when I'm, you know, doing a demo uh, live. And, but what I've loved about this was the, the candle and the light on the face and the darkness around and how you could get a sense of not only the color and the, the, the light and dark, but also an expression in uh, a face like this. And what's so wonderful about working with the acrylic is that I can lay all of these passages in just to begin to get myself started. And then it's dry so that if I decide that I'm about to put a stroke down that doesn't work, I can lift it up and it's not affecting anything here. I'm not having to scrape it off and maybe lift up paint that's already on the surface. And that's something I love is acrylic. I, I think I heard someone one time say that acrylic, um, they felt like it wasn't forgiving. I feel like it's extremely forgiving. It You can see even in this early stage, I can still have a, a brushiness to the piece. And I think the secret to that is how, they, how you deal with edges. It's all about 
the edges because that's what makes something look soft or gives you a, a hard edge. And it's also neat to be able to come to something like this and have so many tools that you can use to get really cool effects on a piece like this. And so that that's one of the things we talk about in, in the groups or the different mark making tools. And today, I think more than ever, there are many varieties of uh, acrylics and they, they all work together. And so this is one that I've just recently discovered that's kind of cool. It's a 3D, uh, it's made by Snellier and it's a 3D liner. And what I find is as I'm doing a painting like this, I can take this and I can draw with it and the paint comes out and it's just raised the tiniest bit. But what it does is it allows me to not only create texture, but to begin to get some more depth. And then I can cover over this with other applications of, of paint and I can get wonderful nuances and, and color washes. And it's just so much fun to be able to do something like this and then see how it looks. And if I feel like I need to make a change to it, I'm able to simply take a, a paper towel and you know lift passages of it off if I want to, or come in and move it around, even just using the paper towel as, as a tool, which I do tend to do often. But there are other really great tools that we can use. Um, I, I love using the uh, Filbert paintbrushes. They're fantastic. There's also some really great dagger brushes and I'll make a few strokes with these so you can see how the, what the dagger brush allows you to do. But then there are other options such as the acrylic inks or the high flow if it's golden. Golden has high flow, Liquitex has acrylic inks. And I can show you, I'm gonna show how I can run some of those inks over what's already here and we can get a different effect that way and then it's always fun to add a sponge sometimes and use this to apply paint so it's letting you vary these edges and not only are you creating depth by doing that but you're also creating um different mark made mark that uh, i want to back up and say this a little bit better you're letting the paint speak the paint, it's more about your paint application and all the wonderful things you can do with it rather than having everything be exactly the same. And so this is just putting acrylic ink on the paper towel and you can see it's a little bit more transparent, but I let it catch in places where I want it to catch. And then what I do is I always look at it in the mirror and I see how it's it's reading, if it's giving the effect that I want. But it has so many possibilities because it's transparent. So when it dries, it's not going to have as much heavy chroma in it. I, I can choose to have more heavy chroma. But Chantel, I can, also... can I just stop yes. you for a second? Um, there was a question on our... Um on the chat here asking more about the selenier pan that you had so if you oh, can yes, the pen. a little bit about that and yes. uh, and um yeah it's and the other thing that i was i was just going to mention uh i love when i when i'm watching you work and stuff is uh that idea that you talked about uh that th this is the play time to, yes. with, to play with the paint and be inventive and so on and that nothing needs to be perfect right now because mm -hmm. even as you're painting you you see these things that if it was my painting and I was painting would drive me crazy because the eye is not totally out. yes but you're able to leave this imperfections and then work on knowing it so that later yeah. on they can be addressed if needed right and you know what's so cool about this? Because I'm I'm I have another piece I'm working on that's almost at the finish. And once again, I found 
that by adding a couple strokes here and a couple strokes there, you balance things off and you fine tune it so that in the end, everything has a rhythm together rather than trying to finish the eye perfectly right now. And then I come to the end of the painting and it feels like it doesn't belong with everything around it because I encapsulated that eye. I tried to do it all by itself, but the reality is all of these things work together. Mm -hmm. And by moving around, there are actually moments where you feel like, wow, I didn't mean to paint the eye, but there it is. It's already coming to life. But these uh, abstract Sennelier pens, they come in, they're made, it is made by Sennelier and it's called Abstract Innovative Acrylic. And it's called, it's a three-dimensional liner and they come in, you know, different colors. So I, the colors that I like are the, the neutral gray. This one I think is the white. And then they have this great um, cadmium red orange hue, which is wonderful because it gets some, it captures light really neat, especially in a piece like this. And of course, cadmium red, but then there's this quinacridone pink, which is another color that you wouldn't think about being a light, having a, a feeling of light, but it does. So they are very easy to use. You can apply them heavily if you want. You can apply just a little bit. You can even sand some of it off or lift some of it off, but they add a, the great thing about it is they can add more of an abstract feel to your work, but they can also work with a classical feel too. If you wanted something that felt a little bit more traditional in your painting, but still throwing in, you know, a, a bit of a surprise. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I can show, um, I was thinking what I would like to do is on the nose, I'm going to make a little highlight with the pink so you can all see how, how that works. Um, right in here, I can, and they dry pretty quick. So something as simple as just a, a little, you know, little highlight there makes a huge difference because it reads as a, a warm pink, but yet if you take a value viewer, it's a very light light. So you can create this feeling of glowing, but then again, you come in and you, you add colors over the top of it. So it doesn't have to stay like that. You're able to build on um, these different, different elements. And I hope, did I answer all the questions about the? Yes, there was just a question about acrylic uh, being only, uh, is acrylic ink only transparent? It depends on, you know, a lot of them have more of a transparent feel. However, there are some of the darker colors like the black that can be very uh, solid. And so there, I've learned as I use these colors, there are some that I use more sparingly. There are others, so that even this, this is the cerulean blue. That's what I popped around her face a bit. And it has a transparent feel, but it also has more of a solid feel in some of these passages. So a lot of this goes back to how you apply it. Um, inks can be dropped on, you can, uh, not only, you know, you can drop them off because most of them have this little eyedropper thing and yeah. you can drop them on and get effects that way. You can get, and let's see if I'm bold enough to try this. It's, uh, this is where you have to let go of control sometimes because you never know exactly what's going to happen, but you can even, you know, let it drip down and get some of the most wonderful effects that way, and depending on how much paint you put on, of course, you can have a drip going all the way down. But look already how cool that that mm -hmm. translates in in the painting. And you can see how just from adding the few details I have while the, in this time we've been talking, it's already starting to take more form. 
And so what I do is I, I build on what is already happening. And then that gives me ideas on how to continue to, you know, add more depth to the piece. And that's another reason why I allow myself this flexibility in these early stages because you never know what idea you're going to be inspired by, you know, as your painting develops rather than starting off with a very um, rigid drawing. And I uh, think, was there another question? Things, um, similar to gold and high flow? Or They're both the same or... thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So golden calls it high flow. Liquitex okay. calls it the inks, and I think also uh, Sennelier calls it uh, inks also. So those those are definitely the same thing. Um, and back to the pen, uh, sometimes as I talk, I think of, you know, what, what I want to do next. And so I was thinking what I could start to do, which will help me develop her eyes and uh, make sure that, you know, I like the eyes the inner corners to meet up. And so that's what I'll be doing. But before I do that, it's very helpful to start to just do something like a simple little, you know, highlight. And I can do that with the ink. And then what I do is after I make a little highlight, I decide, you know, how I want to change it because usually it's a little too heavy. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to play with that for just a minute so that I don't get it. And that's when I can bring a little tool like this in, which is rubber tipped and helps it move around so that I can get not only a solid, more opaque feel, but also more transparent, which helps it feel like it's, um, it's more believable for an eye. And that's another thing. These little catalysts are, they're called uh, color shapers. And they're a great tool to use when you're working with acrylic. And if I still feel like I you know, want to lift some more of that off, I always go back to my, my go-to is definitely to use a paper towel and tap that. But that just gives me a place to start with you know, adding a highlight in the eye, and then I'm always looking at my mirror to see how it, how it reads. And then I can go back and I can continue to work some more color around those eyes. Um, before I add that, any questions about the, I did tell you what this tool was, I think. Yes. The, yeah, Royal Sovereign makes these, Royal Sovereign yeah. Limited. Do you want to talk about the mirror? Yes. Oh, yes. I use the mirror all the time. Uh, and when I really get into my painting and I have like four or five things in my hands at once, I find that I'll be looking at something like this tool and I'll think, why can't I see the painting? Well, duh, that's because this is the mirror and this is not the mirror. <laughs> but, you know, I'm so, I, I still laugh at myself. How can I do that? But I'm so into the whole painting process that, you know, you're in that moment, you're caught up. But what, this is just a mirror that I got, I think it was on Amazon, and it actually telescope gadget. Uh, and the reason I use this is sometimes, especially if you have a studio where you can't get back far from your painting, you can look in this mirror and I can see mistakes that I wouldn't be able to see with just my own eyes. The longer we look at something, the longer we convince our, the easier it is for our brain to convince ourselves that this looks exactly like you want it to look mm -hmm. and everything is, is matching up. And then that's why sometimes you'll be working on your painting. You'll leave the room, you'll come back and you'll think, whoa, it looks so good when I left. <laughs> what happened? This, you know, it's not, it's because we, we just started to convince ourselves that we were seeing what we thought we were seeing, but we really weren't. Mm -hmm. I know that happens to me a lot. So I've decided that I have to have ways to give myself what I call fresh eyes again. 
And the mirror is one of those. I look back, I see the mirror, I see, you know, what, if I have a photo reference, I'll compare it to the photo reference. And I'm basically looking for things like, okay, do I have the eyes where they need to be? And obviously I need to make some adjustments here. Uh, how is the shape of the face? You know, what adjustments do I need to make to that? If there's an angle that's off, it could be that I have an angle like this, but it has to go like this. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at those things, but another way to really police yourself, which is what I tend to call it when I'm talking to myself, is a value viewer. You know, just look through something that's going to make your values and you seeing the, the black and white. Because it's funny, it looks very different when you're looking at it with its values as opposed to when you're thinking in terms of color. Mm -hmm. And it's so much fun to see how the colors that you can use that read dark or read light. And, you know, you wouldn't even think that that's a color that you could use in a dark passage. Mm -hmm. Colors can be tricky sometimes, right? They can they tricky, can. trick us. Very much so. So those are, are two ways that I like to keep an eye on, on what I'm doing and, and how it's starting to develop. Um, and back to what I was doing here, I can pop in a little bit more of a, just a dark. And when I do a dark, I, I like the, uh, since there's so much red in this painting, it's nice to go with more of a blue tone and you know, work with the, start to add a little bit of a dark in with the, uh, around that highlight. And that makes a big change. Now I don't, when I use brushes, I don't use uh, water on my brushes. What I mean by that is I will paint with my brush and then when I'm finished painting, I'll put it into the water. I'll keep it wrapped up while I'm painting because the more liquid you introduce to a painting like this, the less control you have with one of your brushes. Uh, everything starts to get runny. And unless you're working with one of the Sennelier, you know, inks that you want to be runny, there are times where you're, you're trying to control your paint and put it on your your surface and all it's doing is you know finding its way is it's gobbing down and you're losing that uh control that makes it it's such a big difference when you're working with uh this medium um so i think what i'll do is show you i wanted to do a little bit more with dripping the ink can i interrupt cool. you chantelle for a second uh, yes. what was the tool that you were using for when you did the blue on the eye was just the oh yes this is has the, the rubber it's the um still the color shaper oh okay and you just mm -hmm. dipped it in a little bit of dark just blue. a little bit of dark blue and put it and what that does is again we go back to this whole idea of edges mm -hmm. you know if you start popping color in and it's too dark and it's too solid, then everything starts to look really harsh. And so I find if I gradually add my darks in, and even now I, I take a double take and I think, you know, I should dab at that little edge there so it's not too hard. If I gradually start to add my darks in, that's how you can keep your paintings from feeling very rigid when you don't want them to feel rigid. It's harder to get to take a dark away than it is to add another dark in. So for example, um, since we're talking about that, on her um, eyebrow here, if I want to start to go, you know, maybe go a little bit darker here, I could take some alizarin with a little bit of uh, burnt umber. And when I start to put this down, it's going to look pretty dark. And especially if I pull up the, the value view and I take a look at it. However, if it's surrounded by 
a lighter value, or if you even just soften those edges, it feels more like it, it belongs. And then you can look you know, for other places in your work where you can begin to add some darks. And another really cool tool is uh, something like this, a soft, flexible spatula. And so it's I can like put- Catalyst, right? Catalyst blade, yes. It's- Catalyst uh, blades. And they, they're really quite wonderful because you can pick color up with them. Uh, but it, like I've, I'm looking for exactly where I want to put this. Like if I want to start to, I can also have this have a transparent feel to it as I lay color down with it. And the longer you work with different tools, the more you know what effect it's gonna give you. And then it really helps you control how, you know, the outcome of your piece, uh, which is fun because you, when you're trying to get a certain effect, you, you automatically think I need to, to use this, I need to use an ink or I need to use this tool. And um, it's so much fun too, thinking outside the box because we don't do that enough when we're focusing with acrylic and we lose opportunities, I think, to have some of these interesting strokes that not only are interesting in building our painting up, but also start to give, um, it, it's refining the drawing at the same time. And the way you lay down strokes are going to help shape whatever it is you're wanting to paint. I also have this habit of, I put paint on and I, I you know, visually see how it works. And then sometimes I take some of it off. And because sometimes what's left is exactly what I want. So it becomes um, this fun process of, putting something down, trying it, and you know, either building paint up or sometimes taking some of the layers off so that you get very subtle layers of paint and that creates wonderful depth, uh, almost like a, a tapestry would. I'll just put a few more with this and then I think I'd like to go back and do a little bit more there on that uh, candle. Another, uh, these blades come with different edges. So I'm gonna grab one that had, if I wanna take something like this, I can use that to change some of the edges. I can also use a palette knife and cut in and get a very different effect. And that's another great way to control your edges and mark making. And I think I'll go back and put a few more strokes of the cere cerulean blue, the ink and let that kind of drop down the background here because that gives a really nice effect there. And then what I do is I just tap some of it off so that it's not too heavy. It still has a, a transparent feel. But a lot of this, uh, using these different tools and 
uh, approaching acrylic, thinking more about not just your subject, but about your paint application is to create mood and emotion and draw your viewer into whatever it is that you're painting. Um, it really is this sense of um, atmosphere. You know, if if every, when we're in the real world, we have this, this atmosphere and, and the way the light hits things. And so you have so many wonderful accessories out there to change the way you apply paint that visually gives your viewer the feeling mm -hmm. that they're in a certain atmosphere. And, you know, whether it's something like this, where I'm giving the feeling that, you know, there's going to be a candle here and a light that that's coming off the candle and the darkness behind her, or even whether you're applying texture in a heavily lit room, there are just so many cool ways uh, to do that. And it's, it's helping to give, it, it helps the artist. It's almost like you have a helping hand because you're able to give this sense of uh, tangible that otherwise the painting might feel really flat. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that makes sense. Yes. It, and it's, it's just, it's so much fun to approach it and to use your own creative voice. See, not everyone has to use these tools in the same exact way. You know, we all have our own perspective. And that's the thing I love about doing the, the mentorship groups is helping each artist who's in the group find their voice and how to best use these tools to be able to bring even more to the paintings that they are already creating. Yes. Questions, comments, anyone? I have um, a question, Chantal. Hope I don't yes. put you in the spot. It always impresses me how brave you are, that you just yeah. go in and throw paint <laughs> on what I think is already a beautiful piece. Is it because you, you just know from experience that you can work with it and change it, or is it is it something you learn or um, something you just have? <laughs> it's, it, I had to learn it. It didn't come automatically. I was very timid in the beginning, a very timid painter. But what I found was that I could work on a painting for three or four hours timidly and really nothing changed. But if I could force myself to just come in here and paint as if I was, I don't know, you know, myself, but even if I wanted to think, well, how would, you know, Leonardo da Vinci put these strokes down, just do it and, and let go of that feeling of failure that sometimes hangs over us. Then I ended up with pieces that are not only more fun to create, but they're stronger. And if it's not stronger, because that's the thing I often ask myself, well, let's say that you come and you do what I just did and you decide that I like that. However, I think I may have gotten just a bit too much red there. The wonderful thing about acrylic is how easily you can lift parts of it off without it ruining your piece. And I think when I came to that point where I realized, let's remove that fear factor then it gives you a whole lot more freedom to try things because well, what if it doesn't turn out? I, I lift it off. I, you know, put more paint over it. I can sand things down. And actually some of the things that I thought were horrible mistakes ended up being the best thing about the painting because it created nuances in the background. I simply would not have gotten if I hadn't gone through those steps and, and thrown that paint on. So it comes from kind of silence. That, you know, there's a time to be thoughtful about what you're doing and to ask yourself, well, you know, should I put this mark here? Should I do this? But then there's a time to just 
jump in and do it and do it boldly and then stand back and say, okay, well, how did that work? And if it didn't work, you know, I'm still standing here. I can still change it. Uh, or I, if worse comes to worse, the painting can be used for something else. You scrape it off, you put gesso. But I was tired of hours and hours of painting. And somebody is you know, mainly a family member would come in the room and say, what did you do? <laughs> it doesn't look any different than when I left. Right. <laughs> and I thought, you know, they're right. I didn't make any change. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not even better. And I want, if I'm going to do all this, I'd like it to feel like I'm making progress and it's actually getting better. So yeah, it, it was hard at first, but what's so nice is the more you do it, the easier it gets. And then the easier it gets, you know, you, you just, it, it's that, um, instead of it being a bad snowball effect is a good snowball effect. Uh, and so that's, even when I use a brush like this, this wispy brush, I, I love these brushes because I can come in and I can start to line things, but they're still very brushy and wispy. So as I'm lining stuff, I still can you know stay really painterly. And I just have to put things down and then make a decision of how it looks. If, if you don't put things down, then you're never really going to know if that is the effect that you want. And tell, how long did it take you to learn to be more courageous and less timid with your paintings? <laughs> um, a long time. Let's see. I think uh, I was, I have been painting so long. I think it probably wasn't until actually the last, 2015 was a huge turning point for me. I mean, before that I was being more daring, but I think it was in 2015 that it became the most daring I've ever been. And I thought I, I had goals and I wanted to reach those goals. And I realized that I was keeping holding myself back because I wasn't just jumping in and painting with my whole heart. I was too restrained. And so I looked at paintings I had done the earlier years and they were okay, but they weren't anything really. I mean, I learned a lot, but they, they were all the same. And I, it wasn't even the way I really wanted to paint. And so I actually did uh, a little, I guess you could call it a little one-on-one -on -one therapy session with myself. And I said, you know, obviously I have to figure out what is wrong and how am I gonna change it? And I realized I stood too close to the easel was one thing. So what did I do? I put my workstation in front of the easel. So I had to stand behind that. I had to get further back. Uh, I realized that I wasn't being as bold as I should be with my stroke. So then I got to the place where I thought, okay, you lay the stroke down, you leave it, then you make a decision. If it's not right, you can change it. But paint as if uh, you are the best painter in the entire world, whether you are or not, you do that, you, you bold plus. I believe, and I cannot remember the artist's name, but there was an artist who wrote in a book that uh, he had taught himself for like 30 years. And he said that the students who were timid, their work never really improved. But the students who went at it with just you know bravado, even if it wasn't good at first, they were the ones who got better and better because they weren't afraid to just jump in there and do it. And I thought, you know what? I want to be that person. And I found that that it is very true. And the bolder you get, the more you want to paint like that. I think it's part of like your, it's part of your learning mm -hmm. um, experience, right? And as I think, 
as you feel confident that you can like you you can't really ruin it right or you can always bring it back to what it was if you didn't yes right like it's not a coincidence that this painting looks good right now I can always go back and recreate it yes in case you put something that you don't like and we there's other things in our lives that we feel like we you know, know what we like and what we don't like. I mean, you know, the clothes we wear, the way we do our homes. The, why is it that when it comes to creating our art, sometimes we're, we can't just let ourselves make a decision of, I don't like that. I'm not leaving it in my painting or I like this. And, and that was another, it v- sounds really simple, but that was another way to make a change. Look at my art and say, I like this, this is working this is not working. And then begin to ask questions. Well, why isn't it working? But then one of the hardest things was I began, uh, I started collecting art from artists who I loved and I put my work next to theirs. And at first my work looked pretty awful, but I thought, you know what? The, The more I find out why I like what they're doing, Mm -hmm. Why do I like what they're doing? And I start to incorporate some of those ideas into what I'm creating. Then there came a day where I could put my work next to their work and think, okay, it, 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 it's working. This is, you know, this isn't bad at all, but it it's hard. It's hard because we want to be, our work is so personal and we want to be really good at it that it's hard sometimes to see the flaws in our own work and then go about, you know, changing those things. But it's so worth the reward, in my opinion. Yeah, but you you, you know what I think, you know, as Lynn was saying how brave you are with your mark making and all of that, but it's sometimes when you put it down, it doesn't look like they're the right marks but you just need to give it time. Like, yes, you know, you give it time. Like, I think as not as experienced as, you know, me not being as experienced as you, I put something down. Oh my God, I don't like it. This is not how the eye goes. And I have to fix it right away. And I see you working and you wait and you kind of live with that Mm -hmm. imperfection. Yes. Until you turn it, but you don't have to remove it right away. Yes. And there's also ways to know that this line that I just put there, it doesn't have to necessarily stay there. See, the way that I put more paint on top of it, it may be that just a little bit of that peeks through. And that's what, that's why it's so wonderful to have this idea of layering because as you put strokes and your mark making on something like this if I came back in let's say I I think if I grab a more of a gold feel and I've got it on maybe a palette knife you know and I I come back over this now you're just getting bits and pieces of Mm -hmm. that or let's say I put that here But then I decide, well, you know, that was a little bit too much. You really don't like that. And I tap it, but I leave a little bit there. Again, I'm I'm changing it so that now the angle of her hair is starting to feel better with the angle of her face. And this little bit that I left in the background could be the sense that there's you know, more extra hair that we don't see because of the way the light is. It could be um, something that's behind it. I mean, there's so many different things that it can be, but it adds interest to your painting. Uh, The other thing that I do want to mention, because this is so important, and it goes with what you said, Anna, about not um, trying to get things too perfect. There is a rhythm, though, And that's really what I'm looking at. The rhythm is I want, I do want the eyes to feel like they are relating to one another, that they have a similar curve 
I want to make sure the eyebrows are going to eventually have a similar curve. Then I look for like this stroke that I just put here. I look for ways to make this curve maybe reflect the curve of the face as I develop it. And I find that if you have that rhythm, that is as important, if not more important than having everything drawn too perfectly. Because the more perfectly you try to draw it, the more rigid and sometimes the less believable it gets. So it's, it's, uh, and they all, all of these things uh, build, you know, one on another. So even with this flame, I was just thinking, and, and that's another reason why I move around because it gives me an idea. As I was looking at that, what I want to do is grab uh, one of the acrylic inks. If I can just find the right one here. Here we go. And use this to add a little bit of warmth into that flame and then continue to, because even the flame has to have a feeling of depth and that it belongs. So I could, you know, either apply that with a, a brush if I want or with the paper towel like I just did. And what that does, what I used it to do there is just give it a warmer glow on the flame so that I can start to create a, a feeling of light that is, it, it's not solid, but it's going to have, you know, this glow to it. Yes. And, and then again, the whole painting experience, it becomes, uh, and I'm not saying, I don't want anyone to think I'm not saying that there's not moments where I get frustrated too, just like everybody does. But you're you're having more moments of joy and less moments of frustration to where you think, oh, I got to go back and paint and I really don't want to. <laughs> you know, that that's not, when, when you feel like that all the time, that's not good. No, no. All right, so we have about eight-ish minutes. Do you want to work like maybe three more minutes? Yeah. And, uh, and, then, and then we can talk about a little bit uh, of, the groups you have and uh yep your I think that's a great time. idea I'm gonna do another acrylic ink and use that to put a little bit into this candle um and even though there's a lot of ways to apply these I do find that using a paper towel with them is is nice because I can control how much acrylic ink ink catches uh and so I, I go back and forth. Sometimes I do the paper towel. Sometimes I do other methods. But the fun thing is this also creates a feeling of not only movement, but of the direction of light. You know, it's making her hair more interesting than having just everything flat. And as I layer this, then I can come back in and put more of these thicker passages of paint over the top of it. and it becomes accents. And what those accents do is they move the eye around the way I want them to. It helps to make sure that this stays the focal point and it doesn't become too busy while still having interesting things going on around uh, you know, her face. Do you try to have uh, the same, or like kind of the same brush strokes or the same marks in different pieces, in different size of the painting? I, I do, pieces? but yet there's also times where I'll throw in something that is very different. Mm -hmm. And then like now, as I'm working on other parts of it, I'll say, okay, I don't like that blue there. I'm going to lift that up for now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think just because we paint a certain way and, and you know, with our brush strokes, there is always a, a sense of things working together anyway, because uh, you know, it's the same artist doing it. So I don't necessarily have to uh, think about that as much, um, but I do like to be able to, to look at something like this and decide 
you know, as, as, as I'm seeing the layers come together, I'm able to decide where I should build up heavier passages of paint mm -hmm. and then maybe have, you know, areas that aren't as thick. And so this is actually a good time to come back in right now and add a little bit of a more light there on the uh, eyelid. But see, now that's a bit too heavy. So what I have to do is I'm always aware of that. When I do something like that, one of the ways I do it is I come in and I, I reshape it. And then this kind of creates the sense of the eyelashes as I let this build up. A lot of doing our paintings are subtleties. We overlook that. We think it always has to be very bold things and it does to a certain extent, but it also has to be very subtle nuances because those subtle nuances are what let those bold strokes really shine in our pieces. That is fantastic. Um, does anyone have questions, comments? Like it's just it's just so beautiful what watching you paint and what you can do with that little tiny <laughs> point of a paint, you know, paintbrush or just a paint at just one spot there that you add and the difference that it makes. It's, it's amazing. Well, I'd like editing. to say thank you to you, Anna, for sending us that email to invite us because, wow, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chantal. This is amazing. Thank you. That it's, was fantastic. It's yes, been a I, joy to be able to have everybody really thrilled that everyone could be here. Yes. Yes. So like, I just wanted to, you know, like just to finish off, um, of course, um, thank Chantel for doing that little demo for us yeah. and, uh, just talk about like, so Chantel has two, uh, mentorship groups that are ongoing. Uh, one is on the first Tuesday of the month, uh, 2 PM mountain time, 3 PM central. That that's where Chantel is. And uh, another one that is on the fourth Saturday, 9 a.m. Mountain, 10 a.m. Um, Central Time. And then Chantel has a course called Starting Off in Acrylic coming up in October. And it's a six sessions, right? And it's uh, a great, October. we really delve into it. October 4th is when it starts and every lesson deals with a different aspect of acrylic and it also includes the demo, but it's a great way to really go more in depth about not only the process, but about the tools that are effective and those that aren't as effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that that's listed on, on our website. And I think one really in, or interesting thing like Chantel and I were talking about before was that um, this is the second time Chantel was offering this course. And uh, on the other time that she had offered, she had people that were on her mentorship group that joined in uh, the course. And it was such a complementary to things you were learning in more depth, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah, a I little got bit good more feedback. focused in the acrylics aspects of the mm -hmm. painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really complimented it. And that was wonderful to hear, you know, to have that feedback from the students of, wow, I didn't realize that, you know, I thought it would, but this even was better than I expected the two complementing each other. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. All right. Thank you everybody for coming. Yes. So this will be the, uh, as soon as we get processed the video, this will be on YouTube. You can rewatch it. You can paint along with Chantel next time when you're watching. Yeah. Um, but yes, thank you very much for coming. And uh, I hope to see you all soon. Thank, thank you. you, Chantel. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.